Hi, my name is Jenny Huang. I am the founder and CEO of Jenny Huang Marketing, a strategic marketing firm based in Mountain View, California. Welcome to my first show, Heart to Heart, focusing on women entrepreneurs and leadership, um, where we celebrate women leaders and uh, focus on issue impacting women business owners from thriving in their local communities. Today, we are very lucky to have a very special guest, Jessie Cool, chef and owner of Flea Street Cafe based in Mano Park. Jessie has a rich background in uh, the restaurant business. She is uh, a chef and business owner for more than 40 years. She's an author, um, a teacher, a consultant in healthcare food services, a mother of two grown children, and a very proud grandmother. Jessie, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled that you're here today. So um, let's start by talking about your values. Um, it's something that I think um, I, I admire in, in a true leader. So tell us about your values as a chef and restaurant owner. Where do they come from? How do they draw your philosophy and the way you see food and running your business? So first of all, congratulations on your first show. That's, that's an act of leadership too. Um, my restaurant, um, my restaurants are driven by my belief system, and I've often said it comes from my politics, which were a part of me as a very, at a very young age. I was brought up in a small coal mining town in western Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where I was taught that um, that who I was in the community was important, and I had to um, live a life of integrity because my father was like that, and my mother was like that. So when I traveled my path, um, which has been wonderfully colorful and found myself in California uh, because I came from a food background. I'm Jewish and Italian and my father had a grocery store. I ended up um, having to survive by getting into the food industry, first as a waitress and then in opening um, one of the first organic restaurants in the country. Okay. Well, you, when we talk, you mentioned something about um, having good food from good sources. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the value that you mentioned about customer comes last. Yes. I'd like you to address those. So when I started the restaurant, um, my, my sensitivities as a hippie or love child, wh whatever you would like to call us okay. back then, was that um, because of what I had learned, the restaurant was ingredient driven. It mm -hmm. wasn't money driven. In fact, it took me 30 years to learn how to actually make money. But mm -hmm. it was about um, where did the food come from? And how is it produced, and what was it in? What was its impact on the environment, water, soil, and people? So for me, that meant rather than just opening a restaurant and pleasing people or mm -hmm. the, the typical hospitality model, mine was that um, I had an obligation to take care of the people who were producing the food um, from beginning to end, so that someday they wouldn't be poisoned by something artificial that we didn't right. know about. And that spilled over to my dishwashers and my cooks, and to anyone who was was in the, the restaurant itself. Mm -hmm. And then I believed if I if we took care of them, then the customer would be taken care of. And I still believe that's true. That's a very interesting pr perspective, I think, compared to where I came from in the marketing services. We always say, customer comes first, right? So well, I when really I like the I really like this the way how you see things. Well, when I tell people that they often, especially um, you mentioned I'm in, uh, I've been a consultant for health care for um, nearly nine years, right. almost ten, and when I told the CEO of Stanford Hospital that I wanted him to uh, think about <laughs> putting the patient last, the poor man's face went dead white. <laughs> I said, wait, 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 let me explain this to you because if you, it's the oxygen mask um, analogy. If you take care of everyone else and they feel nourished and nurtured um, and feed them and respect them, then that is going to spill over to taking care of your patients or your guests in a restaurant. No, it I, works. I do see your point. I do see yeah. your point. I think it's very valid. Um, you, know, you work in the traditionally male-dominated restaurant industry. How do you make it work with your counterparts? And I want to actually ask you to comment on a quote that I'm paraphrasing from a, a Mountain View Voice article that you interviewed recently. Um, you said being a woman is hard. There was a lot of disrespect. Uh, I have to know that I'm not a sweet little hippie chick. I had to learn how to be in charge and trust my values. Mm -hmm. It took me, I would say, 35 years to do that. Now I can say 
my way, not your way. Or the highway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I started, and maybe this is a vein of entrepreneurial, of an entrepreneurial, a natural entrepreneurial nature, I had a, I didn't know I had a vision, but I did. And it was to, to be ingredient driven in my restaurant, uh, to make sure I knew where the food came from, but to cook it in a way that was um, uh, by hand, not processed. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, which was now over 40 years, there were very few women. I had no um, role models except mothers mm -hmm. and sisters and people cooking at home. And the Western way of cooking now is very male dominated and it can be arrogant and it can be egotistical. Not that some women now haven't talking on the, taken on those traits too, right. because some have. But back then being a 27 year old girl who was not classically trained, who believed in organic food mm -hmm. um, and cooked kind of like home but was learning about the restaurant business, I was ridiculed and mocked and, um, and called lunatic fringe. And my former husband, Bob Cool, actually a few times had to protect me from, from the guys until I realized it was really my job to protect myself. So being a woman in the food industry, I never used it I never got angry. Um, I had to fight for what I believed in, whether I was right or wrong all the mm -hmm. time. And I say just recently I realized that um, though it was very hard and I went through many different phases of being, you know, passive aggressive and uh, a little um, angry or not knowing how to be a leader, I had to, I had to learn all of those things as a girl and a woman because there was no one next to me teaching me. Um, when I learned it, I became more of an equalist because I love the guys who work with me, but they are not going to disrespect me or any other woman or each other because they are um, not a guy. And my kitchens are very different because of that. There's no yelling. There's no pot throwing. That's good. There's in, no in cursing. Of, yes, I think it's trying to create a harmony, right? Uh, it's different. I've heard that. They eat differently. They act differently with each other. And if someone comes in that's, that's not like that, I believe it's because I was a mother learning how to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, they act differently. And the other, the other hard thing is because it's food, everyone thinks you're going to, to be the mama. You're right. going to feed them yes. and take care of them. And then when you have to turn around and say, no, not that way, stop it. Or I thought, you're gone. It, it's not easy. <laughs> so yeah. I'm much more comfortable now. It used to be much harder. Oh, good, good. Yeah. So. Um, thanks for sharing some of those struggles, but what about uh, sharing with us some of your triumphs, things that I think being a women chef in the kitchen, you know, are there moments that you feel like you don't have to really... You know, it's you know, interesting. Um, it took me a long time to really accept that I was a success. I never felt like I was a good enough mother. I never felt like I was a good enough restaurant owner because I was juggling both and I was a single parent. But a few years ago, someone was sitting at the bar at Flea Street and looked at me and said, so Jesse, how do you feel now that, you know, organic, local, all these things that you believed in are mainstream? And I leaned over and I looked at him and I said, I was right. And I thought, wow, I feel so good that, and it's not just me, there are other people in the industry who um, were kind of old fashioned and didn't mm -hmm. want to poison our families or the, or the planet, who were mocked. Um, and I think we feel that, yay, the world is catching up and maybe we were right. And then another one actually happened today with my younger son. I'm, I'm cooking more at home than I am in the mm -hmm. restaurant now. I have a fabulous chef and most people don't last as long in the restaurant industry. Okay. I'm very involved, but I'm not in the kitchen as the right. executive chef. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Jonah, I'm a really good cook. And he said, really, Mom? <laughs> I said, I, I can cook. He said, you can cook, Mom. So yeah. part of, I think, I don't think I'm alone. There's an insecurity, not only of being a woman, but in the food industry, it's a very precarious. And I mean, you cook at home. Sometimes mm -hmm. aren't you nervous about putting the food in front of someone? Yeah, I just do some really uh, quick meals. I'm not like the okay. chef who study what I'm gonna cook. <laughs> well, I spend a lot of time cooking when I cook, but it's, it's still that sense of, am I going to make you happy? Is it going to be delicious to you? Am I successful? I don't have a real sense of security every time I do it. it. May look that way, but it's not that way. 
Okay, okay, okay. Now, you, you talk about um, that you don't feel like you're a good enough mother or, you know, good enough chef. Um, I don't know what, why, is, why do you feel that way? Because I think, you know, uh, to me, I think a lot of women, you know, these days, so we, you know, we are afraid that if we run a successful business, we're not going to be good enough mother, be able to take mm -hmm. care of things at home. But I guess, um, you know, in your world, um, I don't know, are there other, you know, things happening that, that made you feel that, you know, I got good enough of a chef, a, a mother, or, you know? Well, I do something? now, because my okay. children have grown up and they're very successful, though, though they were kind of brought up like wolves, because mm -hmm. to see me, they had to come to the restaurant or work. I didn't go to their soccer games. I didn't do what most parents do. They're, they're very independent, and um, in, in some ways, like, again, back to the, back to the old way, where, where people went to the fields and they worked, or they went out and they did something, and the children had to learn how to become independent and mm -hmm. become good community people, a, a very different than the way we are now with kids. My kids were brought up that way, and lo and behold, though I felt like I wasn't bringing them up well, they're, they're really amazing. Yeah, I think very loving, very caring of me, very very respectful and hard workers. Yeah, I think there's a recent article someone says that, you know, I think summer is a great time to have your kids be less structured. Yeah. So let them be a little bit unstructured because they can yeah. survive yeah. <laughs> with us, us organizing all their activities, right? So just to finish up on that, I think the reason I do feel successful as both now, but I was entering a field that was so unknown, I didn't have people around me, especially women, who were doing it the way I was. I, I was isolated. isolated. Even here in Silicon Valley, though, you know, Berkeley and Sonoma and San Francisco had a, a very vibrant food scene. Mm -hmm. I used to tell people, I felt like it was like I was in the middle of Idaho. Mm. Because the organic food didn't come down here, right. I had to drive for it. It was it was a different loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, but once I started joining women's groups and right. going to organizational, um, oh, uh, joining of of the isolation that we feel, I started realizing, oh, I actually maybe be, am good at what I do. Yeah, I think the probably the community is growing too, right? Because in yeah, the past is. two decades, yeah. um, the women in the sh as a chef in the kitchen is becoming more. A more respectful and um, well I had to learn how to ask for help I had to learn as an entrepreneur who wasn't making any money was always behind you know always behind how to get uh, advice I didn't even know how to use QuickBooks I used to count the olives in the walk-in <laughs> um, once I got help and once I surrendered was when I really like any good entrepreneur I think began to learn okay um, you had mentioned what we talk you know you took on some water rules beyond being a chef um, and I, I believe you took on a role being like uh, mentoring the uh, young woman chef, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you share with us about that part of your life? Well, throughout the rush, throughout my career, I started writing books. I've, as you said, I've written a lot of books. I've written a number of books, and mm -hmm. I wrote for newspapers. And I did all that to try to um, to keep the profile of the restaurant up. But now that I'm I'm an elder, because I am an elder now, um, I realize that. I'm not ashamed of using the word mentor. First I thought, oh, mentor, that makes me sound like I know so much. But um, I've been to a couple of women's, uh, I've belonged to a number of women's organizations where now I feel like I can hopefully help them through all the mistakes I made and uh, through all the challenges I had by wrapping my arms around them and confessing. Mm -hmm. and helping them realize I was so imperfectly mm -hmm. perfect my whole mm -hmm. career but didn't know it and by sharing that it would be so wonderful here in this country and I'm, I'd also like to do some in other mm -hmm. parts of the world to help other uh, people but in particular I think women right now because right. I am one and I did that yeah. to um, find the self-confidence and learn how to to become a successful food service operator. Yeah, no, I think it's great to be I hope a, I can. Yeah, I, I think it's great to be a mentor. Yeah. I mean, to help people learn from your mistakes or they don't make the mistakes, you know. Yeah. Um, in our discussion, you also said to me that you want to make your restaurant a safe place to eat, you know, to brainstorm, to have conversation. Um, you even got Oprah and um, Cheryl Sandberg. Uh, met at your restaurant, so that's great. But what I want to touch on is to have you share more perspective um, in making your restaurant a sanctuary restaurant in the community. You know, you mentioned Cheryl and Oprah, and they're 
because I have been in Silicon Valley for so long, there have been some some renowned people who have come into the restaurant, but I never put their photos up because I want everyone to feel like it's a place where they can come and be at home and um, talk and feel like they're protected from from any kind of, um, oh, from outside uh, oh, acclaim or being bothered. But we became a, res a rescue, <coughs> excuse me, a sanctuary restaurant um, because of the current politics. And I've had staff with me 20 years, 15 years, 12 years for a long time. And they come from all over the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And my family were immigrants. And so my feeling is that the people who work for me are my family. Mm -hmm. And they work hard and they pay their taxes. And um, they belong. They need to feel like they're safe and not scared when they're at work. And I feel the same about people coming into the restaurant, that if they... Um, that I want them to feel like at the table as well as in the kitchen, that this is a place that we are all um, that we are all equal. Mm -hmm. And um, I, my staff knew that we became a sanctuary restaurant, and we were afraid that some people not like it, might not like it, and some people didn't. And I'm okay if they don't eat in in the restaurant. And I got criticized for the fact that. Um, I was making the restaurant political, and I don't think I'm making it political. I think I'm just uh, being doing the right thing in my community with my the people who mean a lot to me. Oh, absolutely! It's actually emotional to me, but yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's it's lovely. We all we all care about each other, and that's the way the world used to be. So, yeah, I like the fact that you're being community oriented, right? In that people feel like they belong when they come to your restaurant and be comfortable. And so safe. that's, uh, and that's safe. A, safe. Okay. Not scared or not afraid of what color they are, what nationality they are. That we are all good human beings, and we're there to nurture them, and they're there to be, um, to be nourished. I, I think it's great. I think it will set your restaurant apart from others. It's not new. We've been like this. As my son said, <laughs> how could someone wonder why you're a political mom when <laughs> you've always voiced what you think and feel? Right. right. And we welcome anyone. It's not that we would say you don't belong here, but mm -hmm. if somebody's not kind to anyone, then I will be more than willing to say it's okay if you don't eat here. It's okay. Okay. So it's okay. Good. Yeah. Um, I know that recently you hired a new executive chef to take over I did. the kitchen. Um, now with more time, what do you think uh, your next dream project's going to be? Well, do we talk about Charlie or <laughs> um, my next <laughs> Feel project? Feel free to talk about Charlie so, and the next uh, project. So, okay. so Charlie Parker um, started eating at Fleet Street at the age of 12. His parents live about four blocks away. He remembers my food being in the kitchen. He sometimes <laughs> just says, I remember that spinach salad of yours, Jesse, with the feta. And I said, OK, let's do it again. But Charlie then went off and was a sous chef at Manresa for three years and worked for Daniel Patterson in the city and opened um, Ubuntu. He, he's been this kid that's been all over. Different than me who, sat, who stood in my kitchen watch watched everybody else come through. I learned from other chefs. He went out and learned. The timing was right where I happened to bump into his mom in the local grocery store, and I said, oh, my God, my chef partner of eight years decided to do something different. And she said, Charlie's not happy where he is. So our interview was his family mm -hmm. talked to me, and my family talked to Charlie. Right. And now Charlie is, um, is the future for me. Mm -hmm. We work together, but it's so lovely to have the old menu. And what this means for me um, at this time is I really would like to um, I hate to use the word, uh, I want to regenerate. And in regenerating, I hate the word retire, because retire sounds like you're lying down and sleeping <laughs> yes. and watching television. I want to regenerate and think of ways that, um, that maybe I can share more of what I've done and help others uh, not have to waste the money that I did in learning. Mm -hmm. The joke is I could have gone through Stanford Business School three times for all the money I lost and right. not knowing how to do it. Right. And I have a vintage trailer in Pescadero where I oh. bought food uh, from the farms in the 70s. And I love being over there and hanging out and being next to, um, to that which is real. Mm -hmm. I want to be with my grandchildren more and travel with them, take them on adventures. Right. Um, and um, I love the healthcare work I do. Mm 
So I'd like to continue figuring out ways to to connect food to well-being, which now the medical world does. And if I can um, inspire in any way the simplicity of that now that there's awareness, that'd be pretty cool. And I like to ride my bike. But what did you ask me? What would I do? I think in a conversation you said, what would I really like to do? And I said, I'd like to be a backup dancer for Stevie Wonder. <laughs> that is the one that I want to That's hear. what I'd really yes. like to do. Yeah, that's what I didn't well, want to hear. I didn't get Or that Earth, up. Wind, and yeah. Fire. If either of them said, we'll turn off the mic, go back there, I would. <laughs> okay, invite me there next time when you're actually on stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love the food connection, actually, food and health, because we all pay so much attention to the kind of food that we eat yeah. and how does it affect our health. So I think it's going to be a long term well, we're lost. And Project that you can yeah, work it's, on. We're so lost, and it's so sad because, you know, kids and people don't know that that what's in their food anymore. And I always just was an advocate of, I just want real food. I want the tomato to be a tomato. I want the chicken to not have hormones. I just, and I was like that at the beginning. And I think now they're realizing that, that some of the food, some of the, the ingredients, some of the, the preservatives mm -hmm. or stabilizers or coloring chemical, yeah. chemicals that are in our food have actually been making us ill. Right. So that awareness is there, but now to change eating habits is not that easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's happening. Right. It's really very exciting and happening, mm -hmm. but I'd like to, to do a little more. I have some cool projects at Stanford Hospital I'm involved in. Yeah, I'd like you to have a talk show about that. Uh, that would be well, great. Let's wait till some more happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So what would be a one word or phrase that we would describe Jesse Cool? Mm. Tenacious? What would yours be? Oh, mine. Um, optimistic. Mm. I think tenacious. I'd love to see what other people would say about me. What would you would you use a word for me? Tenacious. Yeah. I, I use both. I think you're yeah. you you, you um, present at your life. You know, you have many struggles, yeah. uh, but at the same time, you're really optimistic about. There's a lot yeah. of opportunities to make things better. So. Well, I wouldn't be in the restaurant business for <laughs> over 40 years if I didn't realize that, you know, my, my core philosophy besides um, the customer comes last, now that everyone understands it, <laughs> is that it's so bad in the restaurant on Wednesday because it can be crazy. It's a, it's a hard business. If it's Wednesday, I know I'm going to go to sleep, and then it's going to be Thursday. Just to start all over again. Okay. Um, I think this was a question that I didn't get to ask, and we'll come back and ask you about it. Um, what will you tell your young self? Because now that you look back at everything of your mm. journey, what will you tell your young self, you know, before you pursue the uh, dream of, you know, working the restaurant business? I think I would try to encourage my young self to be uh, more secure and less insecure, and to um, to to let go a little more, to not be, to not dream about work, though I don't know if I would have been successful if I had, to spend a little more time with my kids, mm -hmm. and um, to, to always remember sweetness in my life, to not forget, what, as I was learning very hard skills of being a businesswoman, that where I started was being a sweet girl, to mm -hmm. not forget that. Okay. Sounds great. Jesse, well, thank you for coming here today. I, I learned a lot from you. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a fun conversation. I hope you can come back next time. So to the audience, thank you for watching Heart to Heart, Women Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Uh, we hope you'll tune in the next one. So see you then.